Okay, um, I'm just going to start uh, by suggesting that we look at uh, this uh, particular instrument of the Mbira Zavadzimu uh, in Zimbabwe as a kind of uh, material artifact that um, one might describe it as an archetypal uh, mechanical inscription technology with parallel components, um, a sort of a coded key template, much uh, uh, in the sort of species of the piano, but with some significant uh, differences, of course. Um, the idea of, of parallel components in music making, the sort of digitorium uh, style uh, of uh, a mechanical device dates back, you know, uh, a long way. The cam of uh, uh, Laos, for example, is an ancient instrument with, digit uh, with, with what one might call digital parallel components. Uh, the matepe on your upper left, um, the kind of 15th century instrument when it had its heyday, uh, very differently designed to the Mbira Zavadzimu on your right, uh, which uh, you know, is uh, more, more prominently played today for re various reasons that have to do with you know, colonial geography and so on, notwithstanding. Uh, then, of course, the piano, which is uh, of more recent vintage, uh, you know, 17th century broadly, um, uh, that uh, I've represented there as a bit of a, in a slightly Africanized way, just for, uh, to remind us of the weirdness of the piano uh, uh, material interface. Um, what they share, all of these instruments share in common, is that they all operate on what one might loosely call uh, the model of the zoetrope. The zoetrope is an instrument uh, that was designed by um, uh, Ting Huan in China around 180 AD, which made out of static images, a series of static images, the illusion of motion. So it was an, 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 uh, something for the eye, an early film, uh, if you like. And this quick succession um, uh, of, of, of static images uh, was uh, sometimes called the wheel of life, and then the wheel of the devil, and so on. The threshold, because it was about illusion, and the magic of illusion, um, and uh, uh, it exploited the threshold where the eye could no longer tell apart slices um, of a discrete quanta, one might say, from a continuum. So, um, as it were, these, uh, uh, the, the Bira, like the piano, is in uh, what we might call, uh, is, is, is a technological device of this uh, sort, or within this species, if you like. Um, of course, the material interfaces uh, have profound differences as well, and I should just point one out, if we look at the Bira Zavatimu, if we want to play, um, a, the first thing to mention, of course, is that the up and down are construed uh, more symmetrically, like the pentadactyly of the hands, uh, that you know, low notes off in the middle and high notes off to the side. Imagine how wonderful a piano would be if we could design one like that, and a great sound we get. But uh, other features to point out is if I were to simply play a Western scale, uh, a seven note scale, and there's a seven note system here, uh, sometimes called quasi heptatonic, but uh, the tuning are very complicated, but that's a good handhold if you want a quick inroad into this music. If we were to play a scale, we'd start on that key in the middle there, from quote unquote G to A to B to C to D to E to F and up to G. In other words, a scale is an incredibly complicated thing to play, okay, purely from a sort of motor sensory uh, point of view. Other things are much easier to play. I mean, a leap from you know, here to here, the 15th is very easy to execute and often is executed. So 15ths and octaves and so on um, are much easier to ex execute. In other words, what Godfrey, you call a bitonal rhythm. In this case, we've got the biregistral separation of two rhythms, if you like, that appear that are in some sense asynchronous with, asynchronous with the motor movements. Your motor movements imply a certain kind of thing that the resulting sounds or the inherent patterns on these different layers uh, do not replicate. Okay? So there's a sort of illusion effect between motor patterns and um, re-emerging uh, patterns, uh, if one uh, can put it that way. Or one might even talk about musical ventriloquism, and I could get into that for a little bit, and we really should. Thrown lines, as it were, that are unplayed by any, any single, single player. In other words, they escape what one might call the immediate direct causal supervision of its makers. Okay? The lines are in some sense other than the sum of its parts, at the very least, to quote, quote, Kafka. So here are a couple of um, uh, uh, transcriptions of this music, and I'm going to rush really quickly through an obviously much more complex uh, world, but just make a few simple points that hopefully are a small intervention into the otherwise uh, very fascinating uh, 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 <clears throat> papers and arguments that are already in place. From here we see, uh, these are the, uh, this is a kind of Kushara pattern, and I'm only going to ask you to look out for the left-hand patterns, which are clearly these octave leaps between register. 
right? So we've got this leap, uh, C, E, A, fifths and octaves. Uh, uh, in that in that case, with a with a with a larger leap at the very end, but the up down character of this is what I'd like you to take note of in the simplest patterns. So beginners begin by just going up down up down up down up down. Same thing for this Nyamaropa pattern. The right hand, of course, is uh, is sustained and interlocked with it. Um, very quickly, one can notice that there are com complex patterns that emerge. I mean, the right hands here with that inner ternary time. Uh, plus the uh, interlocking line. But here I'd like to point out a very small change that the, the sort of beginner and theorist uh, will make, which is to instead of just going up, down, up, down, up, down, it's go up, down, down, up, right? Uh, this is the first thing you learn when you start to improvise with the Embira, improvise within quite strict uh, rules. So now it's sort of up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down. Right, in both of these transcriptions, one of them being Mutamba and the other Nyamaropa. Um, and I'd like you to just remember that this is a, it's a very basic opening gambit for learning the instrument. The bass line going up, down, down, up, down, down, what we might call three, four time um, in the West. Okay? Um, so moving on, uh, one of the interesting things about interlocking patterns is, um, of course, that quite quickly um, <clears throat> they produce uh, resultant patterns or inherent patterns, however we want to call them, they've got different names in different parts of Africa, uh, where the low arrows, the arrows pointing down are in Bira 1 and arrows pointing up on Bira 2, they always play in each other's spaces. This is a very interesting division of labor that produces what we might call a kind of ratchet wheel aleatorics, right? Something unexpected appears, but through this ratchet wheel logic, okay? Um, and here, of course, is the resulting pattern, I'm using X's and dots instead of, uh, you know, circles of ones and so on, which is disaligned from the motor movement of each respective <coughs> player, right? Uh, so that's the first point. I'm going to avoid actually playing all of these examples uh, because of time. But moving on uh, very briefly, and this is just to open up the discussion for uh, the phantom patterns that emerge. This structure, as you see, implies all sorts of different, as we might, we, we might call sort of metric images, according to standard Western procedures, right? So the first box would be, if we're listening out for the harmony of the piece and we're separating the two lines, so we can hear a kind of timbral difference between the two lines, we would put the downbeat either on time point zero or time point one depending if we're listening to the first instrument or the second, right? That is if we're listening out for harmony or metric preference rule 5F or whatever the case might be. If we are listening out for the bass, right, we'd be in the second box, and now we would put the downbeat on uh, a, a time point 2 or time point 3, okay? So depending on which preference rule we uh, uh, allow to uh, uh, take uh, hold of the perceptual scene, we will have maximally distributed that metric time point, even in this incredibly simple setting, right? The third box um, demonstrates now if we are now putting the lines together in inherent lines. In other words, we've separated them bi registerally. We're now following the upper register as against the lower register. At this point, we will put the downbeat either at uh, uh, time point one or time point three. That's the third box. The, 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 the open, that's uh, metric preference rule, uh, we might call the length rule or 5A slash D. In the fourth box, we would put it, if we're following harmony again, on time points zero and two. Again, we've maximally distributed the kind of place in which meter would be entrained in a Western setting. Okay? Um, and then uh, the, the, the final two are, uh, the boxes are uh, demonstrating what happens when we take into account the resultant pattern, in other words, everything as a collective gestalt. Um, and here we would put the time point, uh, we would put the metric uh, uh, downbeat on time point three uh, in box five and in time point zero in box six. Okay, depending on whether we're enacting the event uh, rule uh, or the length slash base rule, the base rule, uh, the, uh, the base uh, has a, a stronger hold on our sensibility when it comes to preferring uh, downbeat formation or uh, combining that uh, with, um, with, the, uh, uh, with, with the length, so length and base rule combined in the first instance and harmony again in the second. Of course, the way the music is played is always with a different element, and that is that the Hosho beat cuts across the binary weave 
with a lot of ricochet so that all three of those beats are more or less filled up with some kind of sonic signal. So we've got a ternary A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B thing going on within the setting. And what's interesting here is that the event rule cannot discriminate which of those ternary settings would be preferable from a metric point of view. So in box one, uh, we have, um, we have uh, coincisions on three and six. This is if we are looking only at the base part. On three and six, the coincisions lie. In, in, uh, in um, this, the second box, the coincisions are on seven and ten. In the third box, the coincisions are on two and eleven. Again, maximal non-discrimination. In other words, maximally metrically ambiguous from the point of view of the event rule playing itself out uh, across this ternary Hosho pattern. Okay, so that's just one thing to notice. Let me move on uh, now to what I think is going to be the crux and the most sort of uh, contributing uh, work that I've done more recently, and that is to take a look at these patterns and particularly the phantom patterns that emerge out of this weave. Now, Mbira players frequently talk about um, uh, a, a sort of uh, unheard phantom patterns that are often associated either with the spirit or with unknown flute players. Uh, sometimes there's even a mode of singing called mahonera singing, which means having inside with the Mbira. The Imbira seems to speak back um, of its own accord and so on and so forth. So how to take account for this? There are many factors, but one would be this sort of um, uh, distribution of register in relation to this, uh, this very interesting division of labor between the two performers. One might talk about this as a kind of acousmatic music, but an acousma that is in fact highly visible, which is a very strange uh, mix of ideas because acousmatic music is when you cannot see the source. Well, here we really do see the source, but it is delinked from its source in uh, it, in interesting ways through this uh, division um, of labor. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, I mean, I think this needs an enormous amount of, of, of elaboration, but we might talk about it as patterns that are sort of ze uh, born of xenogenesis. They are of unknown origin. They appear like phantoms uh, and not under the strict supervision of either player. Um, so looking at the upper box, what we've done here, or what I've done here, is to simply weave together one of the up, down, up, down, up, down patterns, right, which is your arrow up. Right, your arrow up is going um, uh, on time point one, three, five, seven, and so on. It's just going up, down, up, down, up, down, and on pattern zero, two, four, etc. It's going down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up. Okay, so sort of embedding or nesting three, four into two, four. Right. What's interesting is the asymmetric pattern that results. So if we take a look at the upper line, which is the arrow um, above, we would have something like. Etc. Okay, or more uh, accurately, one might say um, two parts, right, interacting in that kind of way. In the lower line, we'd have a pattern that's something like this. Okay, uh, so again, more accurately, and if I give a little bit of a sense of how that is generated. If I took just in Bureau 1, right, just in Bureau 1, uh, we would have something that's the arrows down, it's something like this. Okay, so immediately noteworthy here is not just that we've built out of symmetrical motor patterns an asymmetrical pattern, but that that asymmetrical pattern tends to be conscripted into what one might call or entrained into kind of a ternary time situation. So binary weaves, right, are producing through the interaction uh, something that would be in some ways more ternary or in sync with the, with the choreographic supplement of the horse show that is, um, uh, that is accompanying this music. Um, one other point that I'd like to make before moving on to the next slide is that if you look at the slide below, uh, the uh, down, up, down is exactly the same, the three, four being nested, so it's down, up, down, down, up, down, down. And where the one above was going up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, the one below is going down, up, down, up, down, up. So now you simply reverse your pattern, right? The second player simply reversing the pattern. Well, what happens is pretty interesting because we have a transformation of that pattern. Right? The pattern below has, in some sense, undergone a metamorphosis uh, from initially 
okay, into, and I'll play the transformation. Okay, and what's interesting about this is that all that has happened is that the initial pattern has phase shifted to time point six, and we restart in some ways at the same point. The harmonies are continually stick, staying in the same region, but phase shifting technique produced so a linear technique, a canon technique, that is produced through simply altering what we might call a vertical hand movement, right? And this is one of the magic, this, this transformation that recoups similitude in some ways is, I think, a central aesthetic uh, of this music, or having a sort of respect for the recurrence of uncanny identity. Something like this, I think, is getting at what is at stake here aesthetically. Of course, there are many, many, many different uh, ways in which uh, asymmetry is produced within the system, and sometimes they have time spans that produce not just 12 or mod 12 uh, patterns, but in this uh, case of the first pattern where we're weaving four, four, and three, four uh, interlock over a time span of 24 uh, pulses, right? So here in the lower line, for example, um, <clears throat> let's just, uh, get, okay, in the lower line, for example, or uh, let's just start with the upper line. This is uh, the, the, the first set of arrows that you see. The rhythm is something like this. Okay, and if I show you how that is generated uh, within this context, um, it would be something like the following. Um, so the top line. That's the arrows down. Etc. Okay. The bottom line, even more complex, because in this case it sort of implies ternary at first and then binary, whereas the upper line again is the binary producing ternary. Um, I do think, Godfrey, by the way, that these are well-formed patterns and do not resemble um, what uh, some of the material is that you are working with, but, but, uh, but they're well-formed for perhaps other reasons that I don't have a complete grip on, but it's something to think about. Um, and the lower line, of course, goes like this. Etc. Right. So, a, a, an asymmetrical pattern spanned over 24 pulses, born out of very simple motor patterns that are carefully and in a calibrated way put together. Right. In the lower pattern, I just want to bring out this one of interest because it is what we call the paradiddle pattern. In other words, an eight pattern in the context of 12 that is produced through this kind of weave. And I will play just uh, the, or, or just clap out the pattern from here, which would be. Or it's the classic paradiddle pattern, but in the African case, or in this case, that paradiddle pattern, which is uh, uh, grouped in eight, would sound something like this. So it's a, the entrainment is a, uh, gives us a very peculiar uh, and interesting uh, kind of rhythmic shift. The rhythmic motors, in a sense, are set adrift from the ruling meter. Or one might say, if metric preference rules are going to dominate the show, that the meter shifts, but the rhythms stay the same. Right? And once again, we've got this incredible sort of polyphonic situation. Here's an interesting 12-8 against 2-4 interlock where all the arrows indicate a kind of rhythmic, what we might call theme or motive, that begins at various time points. So that if, if, if the upper line is a rhythmic motive, that same motive is, uh, reappears at time point 10 uh, in that case. And if we reverse the up-down with the down-up, uh, in this case uh, up-down with the down-up, here, we get exactly the same motives produced, but set adrift again into these four phasing relationships. So phasing given forth by motor patterns that have, in some sense, are asynchronous with what is going on from a polyphonic linear uh, point of view. There's one final slide that I just thought was interesting, and I won't uh, even talk about it, but it's in some sense dedicated to our um, uh, 
uh, some of my mentors, such as uh, Kofi Agawu and uh, David Locke and others who are thinking about this timeline pattern, that we can easily generate the timeline pattern out of this um, binary kind of weave, um, and we may want to sort of rethink the genealogy um, of the time point pattern, uh, time point uh, uh, music, out of this kind of thing as a sort of what we might call a xenogenetic fallout um, of the tactile division of labor uh, within an, a context of an alternating weave. Okay, so that's just a final thought. Uh, I could say much more about that, but we'll 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 stop here because of time. So thank you very much.